Masechta Shavias, Perek Dalid, Mishnah Dalid. The Mishnah is going to continue today discussing things that you can do in your uh, in your field to your trees, and these are things you can do during Shmita because you do not intend to improve the tree. Here, the person is cutting part of a tree in order to have firewood. So there are three possible cases that we've learned about. One is a person works on the tree to improve the tree. That's prohibited during Shemitah. Then there's something that a person does to a tree, which is not to improve the tree, but just to make sure the tree doesn't get damaged. We've learned cases about that. That's permitted during Shemitah. And here we have a case where a person is doing something to the tree. It is not to make the tree grow better. It is not to stop the tree from being damaged, but it's simply because he needs firewood. And the Mishnah gives us an example, Perik Dalit, Mishnah Dalit, page 435 in the Mishnah Behira. Hamedal, Hamedel Bezesim. Somebody has olive trees growing in his field and the trees are growing very close to each other, and he wants to thin out the field. And the reason he wants to thin out the field, he's able to do it, is because he wants it as firewood, okay? That's how many of far should learn the Mishnah. The person is gonna cut wood from an olive tree in order to use it for firewood. But there are certain conditions he has to meet in order to do this during Shemitah. So Hamed al he's going to thin out the olive field. We're going to see how many trees he can cut. Uh, just be patient. The mission is going to discuss that. But that's the case. He wants to thin out the olive field, the olive tree field, because they're growing too close together. And the purpose of it is not to improve the growth of the trees. The purpose is to thin it out and he, he, so that he has some firewood. Hamedal Bezeisim, Beishamai Oimrim, Beishamai's opinion is Yogoim. What you're allowed to do is cut the tree down to its stump, but you cannot remove the roots of the tree itself. If you, according to Beishamai, if you begin cutting down olive trees and removing the roots, even if the purpose of cutting down the tree is firewood, people who look at what's going on will say that he's getting the tree ready to plant in Shemitah, and we get to the Maris Ayin problem again. So by leaving the stump there, obviously you haven't prepared your field for planting because you can't plant on a stump. So Beishamai says, if you want to thin out an olive tree field, you go. You cut the tree down to the stump and you leave the roots. Ubeis Hill Omim, page 436, Beishil say, Yisharesh. You're allowed to even remove the root, Shoresh. You can even remove the root. And we're not worried about onlookers who think that you're trying to uh, get you ready, your field ready for planting, because it's only a small area. We'll see what the small area is in a moment. Umodim Beishilal agree with Beishamai, Bamachlik, if you are going to clear a field, Ad Shiyogum, until you leave the stump. Let's just read a few more lines and we'll understand the Machlokas. Ezehu Hamedal. What's the case of uh, thinning out an olive tree field? Echad Oshnayim. You want to cut down one or two trees. You have a group of trees growing together. You want to cut down one or two, and you're going to leave the rest in a condensed area. You have a bunch of olive trees, and you want to cut down one or two. That's called Medel. Hamachlik. What's clearing a field? Shlosha zed betzadze. If you're going to cut down three olive trees that grow right next to each other, that's called a machlik. Now let's go back to Beisham and Beisil. 
If you want to cut down one or two olive trees in a condensed area, Beishamai says you have to leave the stump. You can't uproot it because of Maris Ayin. It looks like you're getting that area ready for <coughs> planting. And Basil says, no, no, if you're just going to take out one or two and, and the rest of the area is going to remain with olive trees, you can even up, you can, you can completely remove the roots from those, from the one or two trees. Nobody thinks you're getting the field ready for planting. That's the machlokus about thinning out one or two trees. If you're going to cut down three trees, that's called machlik. Three trees, even base Hillel, agrees with Beit Shammai that if you're going to cut down three trees uh, near each other, you've opened now a significant area in the field. An onlooker can think that you're getting the, the, the field ready for planting, and therefore Beis Hill agrees with Beit Shammai that if you're going to cut down three, you have to leave the stump and you cannot remove the roots. So if you take a look on page 435, at the bottom of the page, picture 111, you have five uh, olive trees. And according to Beishamai, if you want to cut down one of those olive trees or two of those olive trees, you have to leave the stump. And the picture showing you one tree has been cut down and the stump is left. You cannot remove the roots under any circumstances. But if you want to thin out the condensed area so that you can use the wood for firewood, you're permitted to do that by leaving the stump. That's base shaman. In that case, picture 111, base hill would say you can even remove the stump and remove the roots because it's such a sh small area, people won't think you're preparing it for planting. So if now you go to page 436 and picture 112, you have a case of again five trees and a person wants to cut down two trees to use the wood for firewood, Basil says not only can you cut the tree down, you can cut the stump and take out the roots, again, because Basil says in such a small area, nobody will think that you are getting the, the area ready for seeding. However, on page 436, picture 113, we have the same five trees, but now you want to cut down three. Cutting down three is not considered thinning out, it's considered clearing out. And clearing out that area becomes a significant amount of space. People who are watching you will think that you're getting the field ready to plant during Shemitah. Therefore, if you wanna cut down three trees, even base Hill agrees that you have to leave the stump and cannot remove the roots. Okay, back to the Mishnah at the top of page 436, when are these rules said, whether, whether it's Beishamai or Beishilol, one tree, two trees, or the three trees, you can take the stump, you can take the, you can have, you have to leave a stump, or you can take the roots, when are all these things, these rules applicable? If you're cutting trees down in your own field, then people looking at you may say, that he's, he's violating Shemitah and he's getting ready to plant his field. But if you want to cut down trees in your friend's field with, again, permission, even if you want to cut down three trees, again, for firewood, Yesharish, you can even remove the roots. We learned about this when we talked about removing stones from your friend's field. Removing uh, removing stones, twigs from your friend's field, onlookers will not think that you're preparing the field for seeding. It's not your field. People that are looking at you will assume you're collecting the rocks for construction, you're collecting the twigs for firewood here too. If a person sees, uh, if, if a person sees Ruve cutting down olive trees in Shimon's field, they're not going to think that Ruvain's getting Shimon's field ready for planting. They understand that Ruvain has permission from Shimon to cut down some olive trees to use it for fire wood. So these rules about one tree, two trees, three trees, can you leave, do you have to leave the stump? Can you take out the roots? Is only when the owner is cutting down 
the olive trees in his field, not when another person is doing it with permission. Now, a question may come up in some of your minds. How is a person cutting down an olive tree for the purpose of firewood? We're very, very um, uh, sensitive, especially in Eretz Yisrael, to cutting down fruit trees. We don't cut down fruit trees. You're not allowed to destroy a fruit tree. And it's a Issa Baltashis, it's a biblical prohibition. So how are you allowed to do it? What is the case here that a person's cutting down olive trees in order to create, uh, in order to have firewood? So <clears throat> the Gemara and Baba Kama and the Rambam uh, Paskins that way, the Issa of cutting down fruit trees is derech hashchasa, in a way that's destructive. The Torah says, lo sashchis, you shall not destroy them. In other words, destroy them for the sake of destruction. Um, first, they may cut down trees for no purpose. He may cut down trees because um, <clears throat> there's a question about cutting down trees during wartime. You want to cut down trees, your enemy's trees, etc. The Issa is Los Ashes, don't destroy. And from that we from that we got the famous code words when we were children, Baltashes. You're not allowed to throw away any food. It's Baltashes. And that's where the prohibition comes from. But it's derech hashchasa. It's destruction for the sake of destruction. If a person needs the area of the tree, he wants to build a house where he has a group of fruit trees. He wants to build a house now. He wants to build an extension to his house. He's not destroying the tree for the sake of destruction. He's destroying the tree because he wants to use the land to build uh, a room or to build a building. In those cases where the destruction is not for the purpose of destruction, the destruction is for the purpose of human use. A person needs the space. Or in our case, a person needs firewood then one is permitted to cut the tree in order to have firewood. There is no iser for a person, there's no iser for a person to cut down a tree, a fruit tree, so that he can have firewood. The Torah doesn't say that you need to be in your home and freeze inside your house during the winter, have no wood to cook the food that you need and starve to death, God forbid, so that the tree remains alive. That doesn't make sense. We all understand that. The Torah would not say to us, leave your trees live while you starve to death in your house or freeze to death in your house. The Isser is derech hashchasa, destruction for the sake of destruction. If there's a human purpose need to cut down the tree, it is permitted. Okay, now we're going to Mishnah Hay on page uh, 436. Hamavkia Bazayas. In this case, we're not talking about cutting down an olive tree. We're talking about a person who wants to cut down some branches of an olive tree. Again, the purpose is uh, for firewood. Hamavkia Bazayas. Someone wants to cut down some, some branches of an olive tree which again, he's permitted to do. Lo He now cut down a branch of the olive tree, and now the place that he cut is exposed. If you take a look at page one, at page 437, picture 114, you can see what the person has done. He's cut off a branch. The stump of the branch is exposed. And there was a problem with having an exposed stump. The heat would go into the stump and it would dry out the whole inside of the tree and the tree would die. So you cut off a branch of the tree. You're gonna use it for firewood during Shemitah. That's okay. There's no Maris Ayan issue um, because the person is, <clears throat> being mafkia the tree. There is the Shaila about Maris Ayin.
And the Mafarshim, I'm looking now the Chazonish. The Chazonish says on the, in this Mishnah, the reason why this is permitted, you're cutting off a branch of the olive tree for firewood. What does that look like? That looks like pruning a tree. Pruning, if it's a if it's a vine, it's a biblical prohibition. You're not allowed to prune during Shemitah. So this is not the first case we learned about today, cutting the tree. He's literally cutting off branches, which looks exactly like pruning. And he wants to use it for firewood that's all good. But anyone looking on thinks he's pruning his trees, cutting off branches. Why isn't that Maris Ayin? And the Chazonish says, because the Mavkia, the person that's cutting off the branches, he's not cutting them in the normal way that you would cut off branches when you want to prune a tree. When you want to prune a tree, there's a, a way that you cut the branches off at a certain angle with a certain cut. It's done in a precision way that the, the tree farmers knew how to do. When a person wants to cut branches off a tree for firewood, he's not going to do it with precision. He's going to take a saw or an ax and just chop off the branch. When people see that, they understand he's not doing it for pruning purposes because then he would be using pruning tools and he would be cutting it off in a specific precision way. So therefore, the Chazanish says there is no Maris eye in this case. But once you cut off that branch, you can't cover up the stump of the branch with dirt. Picture 114 on page 437. You want to cover up the stump so that the heat of the sun doesn't go in the stump and dry up the inside of the tree and the tree dies. So what farmers would do, would they would cover up the stump with dirt. The dirt would eventually become muddy. And not only would that cover up the stump, it would make the tree grow better. That can't be done during Shemitah. You can cut off the branch, but you cannot cover it up with dirt because that's going to improve the growth of the tree. So how do you protect the tree so that it doesn't dry up and die? You can cover up the stump of the branch with stones or with straw. Picture 115 on page 437. The farmer has cut off the branch of the olive tree. He's covering up the stump with pebbles, or he can cover it up with <clears throat> he can cover it up with straw. And this way he protects the tree from dying, from drying, being becoming dried out. But at the same time, he's not improving the tree. Again, back to our rule. You can do during Shemitah things to in a field or things to a tree that will stop it from being damaged, but you can't do things that will help it grow better. <clears throat> and by the way, this is one of those many areas throughout Shas where we get a very special appreciation for Chazal. We see Chazal having a tremendous in-depth understanding of what farmers would do. Uh, Beishamai, Beishilo, we just learned about Beishamai and Beishilo, thinning out a field, clearing out a field. We learned about different plants blossoming. Chazal not only were familiar with Kola Kula, but in order to understand Kola Kula, you have to also understand agriculture, you need to understand animals, you need to understand the biology of animals, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, etc. You need to have a vast amount of knowledge. You can learn a lot, but not, now, not know how to apply it. Not only that, Chazal had to have a tremendous understanding of people's minds and how people's minds work. The whole idea of Maris Ayin that we've been spending so much time on is the concept that Chazal prohibited a person from doing something because onlookers will assume that you're doing something prohibited. Yet in some places, Chazal instituted the prohibition of Maris Ayin. In some places, they didn't institute 
the prohibition of Mara science. So Chazal had a very deep understanding of quote unquote, the man on the street. What will the man on the street think when he sees this? What will the man on the streets think when he sees this? One case may be maricide, one case is not maricide. So they had a very in-depth understanding of farming, trees, different kinds of trees, different kinds of plants, how to cut the trees, what, what instruments you use, what will people think, in what case will they think, in what case will they not think, where do we need to be concerned? We're talking a vast amount of knowledge that they needed in order to apply the halacha. Now the Mishnah on page 437 says, Hakotzeitz Korosh Shikma. Shikma, Shikma, as you can see from the name, Shikma, uh, sycamore, sycamore trees. Sycamore trees produced very thick branches. They were so thick that you can use them in construction. You can use them for beams. So somebody wants to cut sycamore tree branches during Shemitah for construction. And onlookers, when they see this, they know why a person's cutting sycamore branches. They're thick and they're large. So we have the same rule. You can cut these branches there's no maris ayin, it'll be used for construction. The trunk of the sycamore tree cannot be covered with dirt. Same reason, the farmer needed to cut down the sycamore branch for construction. But if he leaves it exposed, the stump <coughs> of the branch, the heat will go into the branch and dry up the whole tree and the tree will die. So he needs to cover up the stump. He cannot cover it up with dirt, which will turn into mud and improve the tree. He can, however, cover up the stump of the branch with stones or with straw, which satisfies the purpose. It's covered up, the heat can't go in, and therefore the tree is protected from damage, permissible during Shemitah, but it's not going to improve the growth of the tree which is prohibited during Shemitah. So, the, to, so this is the case of <clears throat> a mature sycamore tree that's been cut. In other words, the branches of the sycamore tree have been cut, the branches grew back, you're gonna cut them again, the branches grew back, you're going to cut them again. Each time you cut them during, uh, if it's Shemitah, you're gonna be able to cover up the stump with, uh, rocks, pebbles, straw, but not with dirt. Now the Mishnah goes to another case of sycamore, and this is a case of a sycamore tree that was never cut. In other words, the branches grew strong and big, and it's Shemitah, and now you want to cut the branches for the very first time. Different rule. Ein kotsim besula shikma beshvias. You cannot cut <clears throat> a virgin sycamore, sycamore that's never been cut before. You cannot cut it at all during Shavias. We learned a moment ago that if it's been cut already once before, you can cut it, but you can't cover the stump with dirt. You can cover the stump with pebbles or with straw. If, however, the sycamore was never cut before, you want to now cut it for the first time in Shemitah, absolutely prohibited, Mepneshi Avoda, that's a real Avoda. Chazal understood that the first time you cut the branches off a sycamore tree, the sycamore tree now is gonna produce better, bigger and thicker branches. So the first time you're gonna cut the branches, absolute prohibition according to this opinion, you cannot cut sycamore branches the first time, for the first time in Shavias. If it's not the first time, you can cut them and cover up the stump with pebbles or straw. Reb Yehuda Omer. Reb Yehuda disagrees with this opinion. Reb Yehuda says, if you want to cut down a sycamore tree, 
in Shemitah that's never been cut down before, the virgin sycamore tree. It's never been cut before. You want to cut it for the first time. The first opinion said absolutely prohibited during Shemitah. Rabbi Yudah says there's a way to do it during Shemitah. Kedarka Asa. If you want to cut it the normal way, how do you normally cut the the uh, shikma, the sycamore? If you take a look at picture 116, the way that these the people who grew sycamore trees would cut it so that they can use it for construction and still allow the sycamore to grow back, they would cut it at 10 tfachim. That was the normal process by which they cut the sycamore tree. <clears throat> they cut it at 10 tfachim or lower. And that would make the tree grow back stronger. And that's prohibited during Shemitah. That is Rabbi Huda Shita. Ella, last line on page 437, if you want to cut down a sycamore tree for the very first time, you have to do it in a way that doesn't benefit the tree. If you want to make it grow better, you can't do that during Shemitah. Cutting the sycamore tree at 10 tfachim or lower is going to improve the sycamore tree for the future. You can't do that during Shemitah. Either you can cut it above 10 tfachim, or you cut it down to the very stump and you just leave a stump behind. So the first opinion of the Mishnah was that you cannot cut down a sycamore tree for the very first time in Shemitah at all. Rabbi Yudah says you can, but you have to be careful. You can't cut the sycamore down at 10 tfachim or lower, because that's the place where you normally cut it the first time so that it will grow better. You can't do that during Shemitah. What you can do is cut it above 10 tfachim, or cut it all the way down to the stump. <clears throat> Next Mishnah, page 438. Hamazanev begafanim. Vahakotzeitz konim. Somebody wants to trim his grapevine. Now, this is automatically going to be a problem for us. How do you trim a grapevine? Those are one of the four things that are prohibited by the Torah in Parshish Bahar. In vain nizirech lo siftzar. Uh, you're not allowed to pick grapes, you're not allowed to prune a vine. And this mission is talking now about trimming a vine. We'll deal with that in a moment. Hamizane Bagifanim, somebody wants to trim grape vines, Kotzeitz Kanim, or he wants to cut down reeds in a in a field that's growing reeds. Rabyosi Aglili Omer Yachik Kefa. Rabbi Yossi Aglili says you have to do it at a distance of a tefah. If you want to cut reeds during Shemitah, you have to leave at least a tefah of the reed from the ground. So if you look at picture, picture 118 on page 438, it's showing you reeds. You can cut them, but you leave a tefah. Picture 117, if you want to cut branches off a grapevine, you leave a tefah on the vine. You don't cut it down to the vine. You leave a tefah there. In the picture 118, you don't cut the reed down to the ground. You cut it and leave a tefah there. Now, although the person who is doing this gives the appearance that he's pruning. It's a real Maris eye in question. He's taking a, 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 a pruning shear, whatever he's doing, and he's cutting um, grapevine. And that looks exactly like pruning. You talk about a real Maris eye in question. Again, the, the reason the person is pruning, according to the Mepharshim, the reason he's cutting off these branches of the vine is because he needs some firewood. 
and he's not doing it in order to improve the growth. Again, the Chazonish tells us that the reason why this is permitted is because the person who intends to prune a grapevine is going to use a pruning tool. He's going to also cut the vine at a certain angle with a precision. However, the person who's cutting the branches off a grapevine and he wants to use it for firewood, he's not cutting it with the precision of pruning. That's not his goal. His goal, if he wanted to prune it, it would take time. He would get the right tool. He would cut it at the right angle to make sure that the vine grows better. But he's not taking out the time to do that. He's just slicing off a, a couple of branches so that he has some firewood. Therefore, there's no maris eye in the case of the vine or in the case of the reeds. Again, this maris ayin issue is something that Chazal developed and something, when I say developed, means that they applied. They applied the rules of maris ayin as they understood it in those times, given the way people maintain their fields, cut their fields, prune their trees, prune their vines. They had the understanding of what was common in those times and what was not common. To the extent that something was common, there was a maris ayin. If it was uncommon, it wasn't a maris ayin. A person that took an ax and just chopped down some branches from his vine, he didn't give the appearance that he's pruning his grapevine. That would be done in a completely different way, and therefore, there's no maris ayin. So again, page 438, Hamazane Bakafanim, he's cutting branches of a vine, Bakotitz Konim, and he's cutting reeds. Abyosia Glili Omiyaka Tefach. Abyosia Glili says you have to leave a tefach of the branch on the vine, picture 117, or a tefach of the reed coming out of the ground. And since that's not the normal way to prune or cut, people understand you're not pruning and cutting for the sake of benefiting the field, you're doing it for some other reason, for example, firewood. Rabbi Akiva Omer. Rabbi Akiva says, Kotzeitz Kedargo, Ricardo, Ovamagal, Uvamagera, Uvachoma Shiyirza. Rabbi Akiva disagrees with Rabbi Osi. And Rabbi Akiva says, you're allowed to cut the vine and you're allowed to cut the reeds in a normal way, even within a tefah. Rabbi Yossi said that if you want, Rabbi Yossi Gili said, if you're going to cut the vine or you're going to cut the reeds for firewood, leave a tefah behind and then people will not suspect you of violating Shemit. Rabbi Akiva says, you can cut it the whole thing down. And you can cut it with an axe, a mag, a cardo. You can cut it with a mago, a sickle. You can cut it with a magewe, cut it with a saw. You can do whatever tool you want. Why? Because Rabbi Akiva says, again, the whole point is that people shouldn't suspect that you're violating Shemitah. So Rabbi Yosef clearly says, in order for people not to suspect that you're violating Shemitah, leave a tefach of the vine behind, or leave a tefach of the reed behind. Rabbi Akiva says you don't have to leave a tefach behind. You can use any tool you want, and you can cut the vine down to the, you can cut the branch down to the vine, you can cut the reed down to the ground, because you're chopping it. If you take these tools and just chop it, it's not done in the precision way that you would be cutting a reed field or that you would be pruning a vine. If you're just chopping with a saw, with an ax, with a sickle, you just walk over to the vine, you go, and you just cut. You're not doing it in the precision way that a farmer would do it if he intended to prune to benefit the vine. You're just slicing, cutting. Therefore, you don't even have to leave the tefah behind. Rabbi Yosef Gili says, leave a tefah behind so nobody thinks you're violating Shemitah. And this way they understand you're taking it for firewood. Rabbi Akiva says, you don't have to leave a tefah. The mere fact that you're cutting it and just slicing it and not doing it the way a farmer would do it, going over carefully and cutting it at a certain angle in a certain way, 
people understand that slicing and just cutting off branches is not an act of pruning, and therefore there's no maris ayin. Elon <clears throat> the bottom of page 438, a tree that the the uh, it's split. <clears throat> You can tie it in Shavias, Lo Shayale, not in a way. Take a look at picture 120. You have a tree that split, a branches that split. The, the tree, um, the tree split in the middle. Picture 120. Now, if you leave it that way, the split's gonna get worse and worse, and the tree's going to die. You don't have to watch trees dying in Shemitah. You're allowed to do things to make sure trees don't die, that they don't get damaged. You can't improve them. So Elon Shanif Shach, bottom of page 438, a tree that split, you can tie it together in Shavias, not to make it better. In other words, not to make sure that the two halves grow back together again because that would improve the tree. Ela Shelo Yosef, you try to tie it in a way that the crack does not get worse. So if you tie it in a way, and I can't describe to you the way, I assume it's very tight. If you tie it very tight, the two parts of the tree will come together and grow together and you're improving the tree. That's prohibited. Ela Shelo Yosef, if you tie it loosely, that will help the tree not come completely apart and die. That is permitted during Shemitah. Lo sheyale, it not to get better, Ela shelo yosef, that it should not, the crack should not get any worse. So again, we have the rule that what is prohibited during Shemitah is making a field better, Watching a field die, watching trees die, is not God Shemitah Chas V'Sholom. To the extent we need to do things in the field to protect things from dying and damage, that is permitted. Again, one has to learn the halachas. Doing things in a field that the purpose of which is to improve growth, that's prohibited. Imir Tashem, the next time we learn Shviyas, we're going to go into a new subject. And this becomes very, very relevant for us. It's all relevant for us. But this becomes very relevant for us. The rule of eating the fruits of Shemitah in the best way possible. Because of the importance, the Kedusha, the holiness of the fruits of Shviyas, they have to be used for the very best purpose. So we raise the question, for example, you take grapes that have Kedusha Shavias. Again, what does Kedusha Shavias mean? There has to be, it has to quote unquote have blossomed, whatever the halachic definition of blossoming is, it has to be blossomed in the seventh year. If it blossomed in the sixth year and you pick them in the seventh year, those are not grapes of Shavias. But grapes of Shavias that have Kedusha Shavias, pressing them into wine. Can you do that? Are you making the grape better? If you're degrading the grape, you can't do it. Now you can make wine from grapes of Shavias because there's an improvement in what you've done. You started as a grape and you end up as wine. Can you take the wine and cook it? Can you make cooked wine, yayin mavushal, out of grapes of Shavias? Uh, the connoisseurs of wine know that cooked wine is, is uh, not as fine and not as good as uncooked wine. That's why a lot of people are makbid, uh, uh, especially Pesach for the Dalit Kosas. They want wine that's uh, low mavushal. They now have the labels low mavushal. The wine's not been cooked. Cooking wine degrades the quality of the wine. Can you press grapes that are Shavias grapes and make yayin mavushal cooked wine? And certainly there's a question, can you press Shavias grapes and make grape juice out of them? Okay, so these are the questions that are gonna come up now. You go into someone's field, 
and there are fruits there, they're not 100% ripe. Can you pick those shvius fruits and eat them? The answer is going to be, depending upon the fruit, you're degrading the fruit. The fruit, in order to fully enjoy a fruit, it needs to be ripened to a point that it's um, common for people to eat it. Just to walk into a field and pick off shavias fruit that's not ripe and not really ready to eat may not be done. We're going to take a look at these halachas beginning in Mishnah Zayat. Yeah. <laughs>